I've been a Christian ever since I was 12, but I need to qualify that and say at 14, I quit the church because I thought it was full of a bunch of hypocrites and I wasn't going to be a part of it. And it uh, didn't mean I didn't believe in Jesus, didn't believe I uh, didn't have a faith, but at the time I was being very judgmental. And it wasn't until I was 27 after graduating from law school that I set foot back in a church and I couldn't get enough of it. And I, and I heard, understood this concept of grace and it's just been a lifelong journey for me uh, as, I, as I go forward. So I'm, I'm very thankful to be here. Uh, I am uh, married. My wife Patricia and I have been married for 29 years. I got married when I was 34. I uh, had my first child at 36 and I have three of them, 27, 25, and 22. My oldest work, works at Watermark Church in Dallas and in five weeks he's going to bless us with our first, first grandchild. So we're very excited about that. Um, I thought what I would do is I'm going to tell a couple of stories, if that's all right. I think stories for me sink memory points. Uh, I'm going to be very honest here. I was struggling as to what to say, and I started down one path thinking I'll talk about this. And I go, no, that doesn't sound sincere. That's not going to be work. And so you'll, you'll see, you'll see a, a couple of pages of some scriptures, and I'm going to talk about those briefly. So I started down that path, and I'm thinking, nah, that's not working. And so... Literally, it's yesterday, and I'm still struggling with what I'm going to say, so I went to the gym, got on a stationary bicycle, rode 21 miles, and after it was over, I said, Lord, I'm not getting this. What do you want me to say? And all of a sudden, it was click, 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 click. Oh, well, I can do that, you know? And, and I realized that he's the one in control. I need to turn it over to him all the time, and, and so uh, here, here we go. I put a couple of pages of Scripture here. The first when. When Dan said, hey, you want to talk about leadership, I, I, I figure God puts you in a place. You know, if somebody asks you for that, I think, okay, this is a God thing. I need to be prepared for that. And so my first deal was to start studying Scripture. And I put just two pages of Scripture, if you, if you see this piece of paper. But what I realized in looking at this, every single page in the Bible has something about leadership. And it, you really couldn't go that route because everything has a story. You know, everything has a, evidence is a trait you should or should not do. Everything has a, an example. Every, and it just, you know, and the greatest one of all is Jesus. I mean, wow, you know, he's the, he's the ultimate servant leader. And so anyway, I put these down there to give you an idea for, because for me it was meaningful to read something that would say, don't, don't do this, don't do that. But from a leadership perspective, it was showing humility or it was showing perseverance, or it was show, showing courage, or it was showing integrity, or some of those characteristics that we admire in leaders. And so look at, the, look at those scriptures, and you're going to quickly realize that there's many of them like that, but they all have leadership attributes, or many of them have leadership attributes in them. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what occurred to me last night was that what, what would I want to hear and it dawned on me, kind of God pulling the scales off my eyes and saying, well, you know, duh, you've got some great examples of leaders in your life. So I'm going to talk about a few of the leaders that have had profound impacts on me, that literally life-changing. And so the, uh, uh, we'll go through those. I'll tell you some stories about them, just examples of, their, of, of what they've done. The first gentleman uh, I've known for... 27 years, because my daughter's 27, and I met him the year my daughter was born, so it's easy. Uh, he was my boss for 13 years. He's a business partner today. Probably more than that, he is one of my very dear friends. Uh, his name is Bruce. Um, I met him because I had come back to Austin. I had been living in Southern California. I was attorney by training, and I came to be general counsel of any, any of you over 40 you probably remember an old company called Milburn Homes. Way back when, they built homes around Central Texas. Well, I was general counsel of that company in 1991. And in 93, Mr. Milburn uh, decided he was going to sell the company, so I got to hire the investment bankers and, you know, go through the process and select what we thought, we thought was the best buyer. And it was Bruce's company, which was a Phoenix-based company. I think uh, Dan knew them, Continental Homes out of Phoenix. They're no, they no longer exist. They, they were sold to another company years later. And Bruce was the lead negotiator on the other side. And so... My boss, who was a good man but not necessarily trustful of everyone, he couldn't talk to him. Every time they asked a question, he would freak out. They're not going to do this deal. They're not going to do this deal. And, and anyway, I kept saying, I'll handle it. I'll handle it. And so we went through some fairly intense negotiations. My boss made a lot of money uh, in the sale. 
But about two weeks before the closing, Bruce and the chairman of the company came to me and said, hey, we like, you've been very helpful. We like the way you negotiate. You've been very transparent. Uh, we have an opening for you if you'd like to stay. And I'm like, great, I got a job. I'm happy. You know, I got two little kids. I didn't, you know, I was a little worried about that. And so started to work for him. And about three months into it, our head of land left. And I had been doing a lot of the legal work for it. I'd been an ex-banker. And so I just kind of took it over while we looked for someone. And after about 90 or 120 days, Bruce came to me and said, I think you're doing a pretty good job. How would you feel about doing this? And I'm like, sounds fine to me. Let's do it. And so he let me take over a position at the largest home builder doing something I had never done before. And he was gracious enough to let me make mistakes. I worked very hard and I turned out to be pretty good at it, I think. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But I kept on. And if I made a mistake, he'd say, well, what, what, did, we, what did we learn from that? And I said, well, I'm going to do this next time and I'll do this next time. And we just kept getting better and better. And over 13 years, 11 years, we did 20,000 units. And so great education for me literally transformed what I do today. But he was gracious enough not to judge me every time I made a mistake. I can think of only one time that was a true mistake and cost our company money. And he said, what did we learn from this? And I said, this, this, this. He goes, that's good with me. Let's go do it. And so I just, I mean, you know, somebody else would have kicked me out. Somebody would have fired me. Somebody would have done something. And he was just this gracious man. He treated me this way over and over. And, and my wife, in fact, he's still a good friend. A week ago Thursday, my wife and his wife, and we went to dinner. And my wife, they all joked that he and I had a business marriage because we argued all the time. But it was always done in a constructive way of him asking me questions. Why are you doing this? And, and I would say, because of this. And he'd go, you know, and he would challenge me and we would make good decisions as we, as we went along. But what I learned over time, it turned out that we started going to the same church. I was already there and he showed up and it's like, wow, what, you know. And so we would see each other on Sundays. But he had this, you know, and I was, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about myself in a minute, but he was just this person who had this, he helped people. He did things. I'm going to choke up here a little bit. I had a paralegal working for me who was literally brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And so I was able to train her to do drafts of purchase contracts, to train her, uh, train her, tra uh, train her to draft restrictive covenants that you see in your communities, train her to do easements. And she was saving our company over $400,000 a year because I didn't have to go hire high-priced attorneys. If you need your attorneys, I'm one too, so don't get mad at me. But, but we're saving a bunch of money and, and doing this. And, and the, because our company was, was at the leadership that it had, we had a bonus system that a certain percentage of our profits, no matter what we made, were to be distributed to every employee in the company. And it was a, you know, for, for an administrative assistant making $25,000, she might get a $3,000 bonus at Christmas. That, that was big money. You know, and depending on your compensation, you would get more. And she was not, this, this paralegal was not making a lot of money, but she was going through a, uh, she had a marriage that was not a healthy relationship. And in fact, it was abusive. And she, I, I cared about, you know, everybody that worked for me and she was upset one day. And so I asked her and she relayed what was happening and it was, it was dangerous. I suggested, you know, can't you, you know, you need to get out of there. You might want to stay with somebody. And she said, but I don't have a car. I don't have this. And she just was, was it, she felt hopeless. And I was worried about it. Notice I didn't do a lot. I'd made a couple of suggestions. And I happened to have a meeting with Bruce right after that. And I uh, tend to wear my feelings on my sleeve. And I said, I'm really worried about Cindy. And explained what was happening and what was going on. And he didn't say anything. Goes on. Cindy keeps working for us. Bonus time comes around. She has saved us a lot of money. I know she needs help, you know, because she, she's, she's now uh, left her husband and I think is in the process of a divorce and, 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 and was worried about her safety. I mean, just literally worried about her safety. And so came time to give bonus and she got a very good bonus, probably close to a third of her salary. And I wanted her to use it to better her life. And I said, I said, I'm so thankful for what you do for us. And I'm just, I just, if I could give you more, I would. And she was in tears. And I said, I said to her, I said, are you going to use it to like, you know, buy a car or whatever? And she said, no, I'm going to go back and pay Bruce back. What are you talking about? 
And she said, you know, the day that I found out what was going on and what was happening and the safety for herself, she said, Bruce came down that evening because I was working late. And she, he said to her, uh, hey, I'm going to go put you up in a hotel tonight because I don't want you anywhere near the safety issue. And she said, she said, well, I don't, I don't have a car. And she goes, he goes, I'm not going to worry about that. I said, I'll come pick you up in the morning. I said, we're going to go find you an apartment. She said, I, I, I don't have any money. I said, I didn't ask you if you had any money. And so he took her out that next day, out of his own pocket, put up the deposit, paid her first month's rent, then went out and bought her a car. He never said anything to anyone. In fact, to this day, he and I, as best friends as we are, we've never had a conversation about that because he was not interested in getting any reward for that. But man, what a leader. He was serving her in a way that very few people could. When she asked him, why are you doing this? He said, I couldn't live with myself knowing that I have the means to protect you and I didn't do that. And she'd say, I can't pay you back. He goes, I don't want any money back. I don't want you safe. You help this company, you're a valuable employee, I'm going to take care of you. And so, life lesson for me, I now have loaned money to people who work for me. I have helped people get into housing that they couldn't have. You know, I've, I've, in fact, we're going to do this next week with one of our employees who's going through a divorce, and we're going to help give her some money so that she can divvy up her house with her husband. But I learned that from, from him. He also had the ability to say things that were hard to say. A little bit of back backstory. He was the president of the company. I was the vice president of the company. I'm the number two guy. So when he was out, I'd, you know, I'd kind of take, take over and do some stuff. And we, our company sold in 2000, and a bigger company bought us, and, and, and Bruce was so successful at what, what he was doing, they bumped him up to the number three position in the company. And so he was going to have states of responsibility as opposed to cities and stuff of responsibilities. And so they were going to have to name a division president. And so he took me to uh, breakfast and said, you know that I'm going to have to name somebody here. And he said, I want you to know something. He said, you deserve to be the division president of this company. Uh, and I, my faith was strong enough at that time to say, I, I didn't care. Whatever happened, happened. And he said, but I'm not going to name you the division president. And he said, there are five people in the company that can do what, can, man can manage budgets and take care of people. But he said, I only have one in the company that can go out and look at a piece of property and decide what needs to be there and then get it built. And that's you. He said, you're worth far more to the company doing what you do. So to be fair, he adjusted my compensation. He gave me responsibility of other cities and all this kind of stuff to try to make me feel good. And I said, fine, I'm okay with it. When the announcement was made, there were lots of people that came up to me and started talking about how I'd gotten screwed and how I got cheated out of this and whatever. And in my weakness, I started believing them. And, and uh, you know, it was like, well, maybe he, was, maybe he wasn't telling me the truth. Maybe he was saying that to let me down easy. Maybe I wasn't qualified for this. And I'm just going through this insecure, turmoil, prideful, you know, stuff. And uh, we've had this conversation. I, I like to exercise. So I was up at, this was before my knees gave out. I was up running. And I turn a corner at Bowman and Shuley in West Austin, if you know where that is. And I'm kind of angry at God. And I said, what do you, and by the way, let me back up. One of my buddies who also developed, and we'd co-develop a bunch of deals, he'd say, oh man, you dodged a bullet. I said, you don't want to go work with corporate. Those guys are idiots. You don't want to work with them, you know. And, and so I'm kind of listening to it. And then somebody else said, oh, you get to do what you love doing. This is fine. And so I'd heard those things, but it wasn't sinking in. And so I turn a corner and I scream out in my mind to God, what do you want from me? Because I'm just in turmoil. I'm not sleeping or whatever. And I heard it as audible as anything I've ever heard, build homes. And it was like lifting the, the scales off my eyes. It was like, oh. That's what I get to do if I don't take that job. Oh, it is your plan. Oh, and it's so I have Bruce to thank for that, for having the courage to say, even though I might have deserved that job, to say, no, this is where God wants you and have enough discernment to know where I needed to go. That was a hard conversation. It was a hard conversation for him, and I have thanked him through the years. So any, anyway, another things that he did. Uh, he treats his family and friends well. 
he does a particular thing that I find particularly unique. About every six years, he picks out at his church six to eight young boys with another guy, and they're going to be their Sunday school teacher for the next six years, from, sixth grade, from seventh grade through high school. And he tries to pour into them as to what they were. He, he doesn't ever tell them what to do. He goes, he asks them questions. He teaches them and he asks them questions. And he, he's on his third round now. So he's been doing it for over 12 years. I don't know where the level is. But those boys, I've, I've, I know some of them. And they say he had the most profound impact on me because he made me think about where God wanted me to go. He didn't have to do that. He didn't get paid for that. He didn't have to do anything with that. But that's what he does on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights, and all this sort of stuff. I just, it's just amazing to me. So what have I learned? I've learned that I, when people want to meet with me and talk to me, I'm getting to be an older codger now, and so a lot of young people come ask for advice. So I sit down and try to listen, and I don't have any preconceived notions about what I should or should not do, but I know that God puts you in places where you can share some of the experience that God has given you to help someone else. So anyway, enough about Bruce. I want to say talk about some key traits that I see in him. One is humility. You would never know from him. I have a friend of, uh, of mine that has known him for 20, 27 years. But he didn't know until year 22 that Bruce qualified, qualified for the Olympic trials at age 14 in a 1,500-meter swim. Because Bruce did that, you know, it's not important. Don't tell you that he won a national championship as a freshman at Indiana University in, where their swim team won a national championship. Just didn't have to say it. There's humility there. He didn't tell anybody that he helped Cindy when she needed help at her lowest point. It wasn't important. You would never know that he has accomplished the things and been presidents of four different companies over and over and over and just had this tremendous success because it's not important. What's important is, is he helping those people around him? You know? And it's just, it's amazing to me. He has perseverance. He has a lot of perseverance. He swims not because he doesn't necessarily like it, but he knows it's good for his health. And he says, it clears my mind because I can think about those things that are important. And by the way, when you, when you swim a 1,500-meter race, you better, you know, that's a mile, roughly. And so he went, he, for ever since, he's 65 years old. He still swims two miles a day because it clears his brain, keeps him in shape. There's perseverance there. There's a stick to that stays there. He has courage. He's faced a lot of adversity. I'm going to give you one example uh, when the new company bought us, before our focus had been on serve the customer. Serve the customer. The very first day Bruce walked into our company, he drew a little circle and he said, that's the customer, that's the center of our universe. That's the most important thing in our company. And then he drew a second circle and he said, the people who build our homes and sell our homes are the second most important people in our company because they touch the customer. Now, mind you, in, in Mr. Milburn's old company, those were fungible foot soldiers. If they went, we just replace them. didn't matter. And so he was turning this whole structure upside down that the least important people in the previous regime were now the most important. And he said the next most important people are the people who serve the people who touch the customers, the people who, you know, get the budgeting done and put the, put the contracts together and get the plans ready and do all that sort of stuff. They're the most important. And he said, and the least people... The least important people in this entire organization are you managers. And, and boy, the old guys are like, what the heck is this? You know? I loved it because I was like, this is what God talks about. I didn't know he was a Christian at the time. I didn't know that, you know, I was like servant leadership. That's what we need. And he said, if we do our job, you guys aren't needed. If we, if we get, help everybody else do their job, not needed. Servant leadership. So when we sold the company, which wasn't his decision, by the way, the chairman decided to sell. He had a large block of stock, and so we went into public play, and all these public builders started wanting to buy us. And a company bought us, uh, and they were more a more traditional company. Let's make money. Don't care how we do it. And uh, Bruce couldn't operate under that regime. He was the number three guy in the company, and he kept telling them exactly what he thought. And when they decided to cut the bonus program for everybody other than us managers, he said, that's not right. He said, those are the most important people in our company. Those are the ones touching the customer, and you're going to cut their pay? He said, if you need to do that, you probably just need to fire me and replace me. Which the day before he was supposed to get a million-dollar bonus, they fired him. 
They fired another guy who at the other division was similar, similar situation, similar structure. They fired him on the same day because they said, these guys are rebel rousers. They're just not doing what we want them to do. That guy sued him, collected $10 million in punitive damages. And so I asked Bruce, I said, why don't you sue? And he goes, it's just money. Not important. He said, they have to live with themselves. I don't. So he went on. And since then, he has achieved far greater success you know, at the time you'd think that's unfair, I've lost all of this or whatever. He didn't care. You know, that took courage. It took a lot of courage. I don't, I'm not sure I would have had that courage at the time. Integrity. That same story talks about integrity. He's an encourager. Even last Thursday night, every time I meet, we'll talk about family, we'll talk about grandkids, we'll talk about all these sort of things. And he goes, how's your business going? And I'll talk about the ups and downs and he'll start making suggestions and saying, what about this and what about that? And if you need an investor in that project, you know, call me. I'd be happy to do that. And just like, he just, his, his stripes never change. He's a leader. The next guy I want to talk about is a, is a gentleman named Dick Rathgaber. I don't know if you know Dick. Dick is 85 years old. He's an old line real estate guy here in town. Uh, I met him in 1997. And it's a phone call, and he picks up, and this gruff old man calls me and said, said, I need to interview you. And I'm like, excuse me? And he said, he said, I own this piece of property with some partners, this thing called Avery Ranch, and we're looking for a production builder and some people who said some good things about you. I need to interview you. I said, okay. I walked down to Bruce's office. I said, you know that deal we've been chasing for three years? Somebody else has it. I said, but they're going to interview me. And he said, well, do a good job. <laughs> See what you can do. And so he comes in and starts interviewing me, and he wants to know my thoughts on how I treat people, uh, how do I approach problems, how do I work with cities, and we talk for like two and a half hours, and I pour my heart out to him, not much, pretty similar to what I'm doing here, but it was different, he was talking about business, and he asked me, he said, what did you do when you were, you know, your history, and so I said, well, I started off in banking, what bank? I, was, I, I quoted a bank downtown, he goes, well, I know some people there, who, who do you work with? And so I named name. I said, this certain gentleman, Jack, was my mentor, and he and I are still good friends. He's just, he really guides me. He goes, I know him. And so the next day, he calls back and says, Jack told me I was an idiot if I didn't do business with you, so let's go try to do some business. And so that's how it started. And the lesson there, by the way, was he does investigate, you know. You remember, remember the scripture in, in the Bible that says, be, be uh, shrewd but innocent? That's him. He is, he's not going to do business with somebody who's going to try to take advantage of him, but at the same time, if he trusts you, he'll give you the shirt off of his back and he'll, he'll work with you. So we went on and started working on this project. I'm going to, it's going to take a little bit of a, a story here, but it's he, we would be working on a project and he would come in every week as we're getting approvals for this project and I would call him because we had decisions to make and he was, we were spending part of the money, he was spending part of the money, so I, I couldn't spend it without his approval and so I'd call him and you know, I'd say, well, Dick, where are you? You're not at the meeting day. He says, well, I'm, I'm in Wichita Falls. I said, well, what are you doing in Wichita Falls? He goes, well, I said, they have a hospital up here. And he said, the, 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 you know, when children go to the hospital, the parents can't afford to stay in a hotel. And so we're building this little, less like a Seton League house or Ronald McDonald house. We're building this little house for them. And I would stop and I would say, Dick, why, why are you doing that? And he would pause every time. Got to be a, it's a joke with us, a joke between us now. And he'd go, well, well Terry, they need one. Okay, and so I, I still wasn't getting it. I'm, I'm showing you how dense I am in this process. So I called a little bit later, and I said, where are you? And he said, he said uh, we're in Honduras. Dick, what are you doing in Honduras? He says, well, you know, they had a hurricane down here, a bunch of people without houses, and some of my buddies and I got together, and we're going to build 100 houses for them. I called him a little bit later, and I said, Dick, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm back down in Honduras. He said, they need water, so we're putting in a water line. And I'm like, you know, Dick, why are you doing this? And and the next time they said, well, I can't get anybody to move out here because they don't have a school, so we're putting in a little school. And then the, let's show you how hard-headed he is. I called him the next time and he goes, he said, uh, I said, what are you doing? He said, we're delivering a fire truck. I said, Dick, what are you doing? He said, well, he said, they, the, the Honduras, they put up every roadblock, the government has put up every roadblock, and they said they wouldn't, they wouldn't, uh, let people occupy it unless they had fire safety. So I went and bought a fire truck in Houston, and they're, they're taking the fire truck. And he said, the damnedest thing, he said, they would, I said, I delivered it. And he said, they wouldn't take a used fire truck. And he said, he said, the stupidest thing. And, and he said, you know what's funny about it? And he said, there's some guy named President George Bush called him and told him to take the damn fire truck to get this guy off my back. And so he got the fire truck in. And so now 100 families, 
2,000 people have water because he did that, and hundreds of kids are going to school. Every time I'd ask him, Dick, why are you doing that? Well, look here, they need one. One day, and, and this happened like 13 or 14 times. Oh, I, I, last, last deal, when we were buying, we were doing Avery Ranch, we had very difficult negotiations. I didn't say he was a weak businessman. I mean, he was a strong businessman. And we got everything negotiated, and I, I'm kind of like taking a deep breath because it had taken like six months. And he goes, oh, I forgot one thing. And I'm like, what could it be? I'm, not, I'm trying to think of it. And he goes, I said, I want, said, I won't sign this contract with you unless for every house you sell, you give $100 to the charity of your choice, and I'll match it. And Bruce was sitting there, the same guy I just talked about, and he goes, that's a great idea. We'll do that. And I'm sitting there going, we just agreed, we just agreed to go away for $520,000. My God, what do we, you know, and it was just this. And so I asked him why you do that. because well, that's the only way I can make corporations charitable. I just make them do it. If they want the land, you've got gotta to be charitable. So I'm listening to all this, and I'm trying to figure it out in my brain. He gave a downtown site for the Salvation Army. He did stuff for the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts. And every time I would ask him, he would say, Jerry, they need it. I'm sitting in his, in his den one day, and he's on the phone. We're about to meet, and I see a big book sitting on the counter. And I open it up, and it says, Edward R. Rathgaver Sr. presented to Edward R. Rathgaver Sr. his father, Lutheran minister, Bertram, Texas. I didn't know his dad was a father. I didn't even know Dick was a Christian. I hadn't had this conversation. How dumb am I? And so anyway, I get sick about a week later. I'm sitting down. I normally don't sit still. I'm thinking about this, and my wife um, quarantines me to a bedroom because she wanted the kids to get sick. And so I'm thinking about Dick, and it finally clicks. I'd been asking him for four years why he's doing this, and it dawns on me he's a Christian doing God's work. And he's taking the money he makes, which is a lot of money, and he's putting it to use. I started crying. I had never seen somebody with that kind of strength, and that kind of commitment, and that kind of integrity. So I wrote him a letter and explained all this stuff. It's like a four or five page letter. I never do anything you know, short. I'm writing this long letter and I say, I see what you're doing. You're a Christian. Your gift is making money and you put it to, to, the, to the work for the kingdom. And I sent the letter and I said, if I can just be a teeny tiny bit of a man you are, I'm, I'm going to be, my life will have been a success. And I sent it to him. What you don't know is Dick's 85. He's three weeks younger than my dad. So we have this partnership relationship, and then every now and then it's father-son. And so the very next week he's in my office, and he walks in, and he says to me, uh, I got your letter. And I'm thinking, oh, here comes the lecture, man. I'm kind of stepping back. And he said, he leans over real close. He goes, it's the damn nicest letter I ever got. And I said, Whew, I'm a little worried about that. And he said, I was so proud of it, I showed it to my pastor. And my pastor told me I'm a lucky man. I got to read my eulogy before I die. And so since then, he has coached me to have integrity, character, learn how to give, learn how to do things. He loves the Lord. There's perseverance. There's courage. There's integrity. There's a servant leader. He's an encourager. When I went to him and said, I was thinking about leaving my company where I was making more money than I ever thought about making and I realized as I was telling it to him, all of his connection to my company was me because Bruce had already left and he had every interest to say, no, you should stay here because it would affect his business. When he finished, he goes, no, you've got to get out of there. That's a horrible place to work. You've got to do this. I'll help you. But you've got to be charitable. You know, you've got to do this or whatever. And so I'm picking up similar things here. I'm picking up humility. I'm picking up a servant's heart. Be a servant leader. I'm picking up courage. I'm picking up integrity perseverance. If you start looking at story after story after story of leaders, they all say the same story. Look at Nehemiah, look at Moses, look at David. They all went through these things and all of those traits are shown. And uh, for me, it's a pretty good thing to follow. Anyway, thank you very much.